You are listening to the Small Town Big Talk Show, the weekly podcast for small town people with big dreams and ideas. I'm your host, Rebecca Andam, and each week we'll cover a topic meant to inspire, encourage, and empower you to live big in your small town. Although it has its challenges, nothing beats small town living, and we're committed to sharing the best of what's working in the communities we serve. So enjoy this episode, and we hope it helps you to bloom where you've been planted. My guests on today's episode are Adam and Carla Armbruster. We recorded this episode prior to COVID-19, and I really just felt that it was time to introduce you to these two amazing people and hear their awesome and inspiring story of how they moved back to Adam's hometown. It's a town of only 3,500 people, and they restored their Main Street Theater into two thriving and awesome new businesses. One is called Sleeping Eye Brewing Company, and the other is Sleepy Eye Coffee Company. And it's such a fun story, not to mention the fact that they have three children and they're both practicing doctors. Listening to how and why they took this on, it all stems back to them wanting to create something that they felt they needed to make their town a place that they love to call home. And that's something that's just a theme in so many of the people that we talk to on the show. And I swear, there are so many communities that have buildings that are sitting empty or and especially theaters. And we look at them and we think, wouldn't it be cool if, well, if you've ever had that thought about something that you want to see on Main Street in your community, you have got to listen to this episode. So enjoy, enjoy this chat with Carlin and Adam of Sleepy Eye Coffee Company and Sleepy Eye Brewing Company. Well, Adam and Carlin, welcome to the Small Town Big Talk Show. Thank you. So excited to visit with you guys. So as I mentioned in the intro, I didn't specifically tell you this. When I stopped through Sleepy Eye on my way back from a speaking engagement, I stopped at your coffee shop. I didn't get to experience the brewery because it was like noon. (laughs) So I stopped and I ate your scone. It was the blueberry lemon scone. I wish that I had purchased and they would like last for weeks. They were delicious and amazing. So the quality of everything I actually ate was delicious, but I cannot wait to hear the whole story. So First of all, how'd you land in Sleepy Eye? How big is Sleepy Eye? And what made you decide to take on this adventure? That's a loaded question, I guess. But Sleepy Eye is a town of about 3,500 people in South Central Minnesota. So my husband, Adam, is from Sleepy Eye. He grew up here. It's his hometown. And we met together when we were in graduate school at the University of Minnesota Duluth and then ended up together down in Wichita, Kansas to complete our medical residencies. We're looking for a place to come back and practice as rural family physicians. So fortunately, back in 2012, they had room for us in Sleepy Eye, and we just love Sleepy Eye. Of course, Adam had a connection as his hometown, and I fell in love with it over the years that he and I had been together, and we were just happy for that opportunity to move back here. Okay, so... I feel like I didn't catch this correctly. What did you go to school for? We're both physicians. <laughs> oh my goodness. This makes the story even cooler. Okay. So are you both still practicing? Yeah. Yes. yes. We, both, we both, I would say, Carlin is probably about three quarter time and I'm, I'm full time. Oh my gosh. Do so you guys run this business? How do you find the time to run this business? And so tell the audience too, a little bit more of, about the business. Sure. So so we own the Pix Theater, which is an old downtown movie theater in Sleepy Eye. It is housed in just kind of a 25-foot wide downtown building space that was constructed somewhere in the late 1920s to 1930s as a movie theater. It had a previous life as we don't know. I'd love to know what it was previously, but they did build the theater with the exterior walls of the adjacent buildings becoming the interior walls on either side of the theater. So it was a long, narrow building, perfect for a single screen. And at one point, they did have live performances there, live theater, as well as, you know, evolving to screen theater. We've met people in town who used to play the organ and other instruments for those silent movies. So you'd actually come and watch a silent movie and then there'd be people live playing music to go along with it. Oh, that's cool. cool. That's really cool. The theater continued on until about, I guess, the late 80s through being owned by a couple different families, um, most recently by a couple here from Sleepy Eye. 
So they closed the theater in the late eighties because they just couldn't make it continue. And there were a couple people from town who opened it on kind of on a limited basis. And it just finally became shuttered for good in the early nineties. So starting in the early nineties, it has been a vacant building. So totally okay. vacant for about 30 years. Wow. Wow. So a couple things that are interesting about that. Did your town, maybe you guys were there when it actually sh- shut down for good, but did your town mourn the loss of the theater? That's a big deal. You know, I, but I also recognize you're what, 10 miles or so from New Ulm. Is that correct? Yeah. Yeah. Roughly 10 to 15 minutes from New Ulm. Yeah. And I think, you know, there is something to be said about the kinds of businesses the business mix that a small community can sustain depending on its proximity to a larger town. Do you feel like that's true? And, you know, it just basically became, it's only 10 minutes to drive into New Ulm to hit a movie theater. So you just couldn't sustain it. Yeah, I think, uh, well, that's very much true. I think that applies to restaurants and and other uh, kind of other entertainment or uh, social type gatherings. It's really hard to maintain them if you have great options or more options just 15 minutes away. Right, right. Did you feel like the community was that hard for everybody? Or honestly, was it just kind of a natural thing? It's hard to say. I was young. I was probably around 10, 11, 12 when it it closed the second time. It was getting pretty run down by that point. So I don't think it was a huge surprise, I guess, on from an adult's perspective, most likely. You know, it was horrible for us. It was it was functioning (laughs) rental shop as well. So it'd rent movies and, and video games and things like that while it was a movie theater, but it was never, it never quite functioned the way it had with the previous ownership. It was in very rough shape. So I, I mean, I don't know if if some people I think were happy that closed before the ceiling fell in on people or. Yeah. uh, Right. But kids were devastated. I know that. Yeah. So the building sat vacant then it was in rough shape when it closed. What condition was this building in when the two of you decided you wanted to do this? And honestly, what, I don't want to say what possessed you. Partly, I want to ask that question because seriously, and that's why I clarified, I thought you said you were, that you were, you had gone to school and you're doctors and not to say that doctors can't do something on the side, but you didn't tackle a small project. Yeah. I mean, what you guys, (laughs) what you took on is huge. So talk to us a little bit about that. Yeah, please. When you said the word possessed, that's probably how we felt. (laughs) Well, the condition of the theater when we came upon it. So like we said, it was closed down from the early 90s until when we purchased it. And there was a there's a, a gentleman from town who ended up obtaining the building from the city after it had been repossessed after the roof actually did fall in. Okay. Um, he obtained the building, he put a roof on it and basically cleared out whatever was inside that was not salvageable, sold off other things and gutted the building mostly. So it did get a new roof on it. And then it did get the, instead of having the floor inclined or towards the screen in the back of the building, yeah, um, he leveled out the floor. So the floor was completely level. But other than that, he was using it as storage and had it for sale for a number of years and just never was occupied in the meantime. So the way that we decided to start looking at the building is because having lived in different various cities, I grew up in Northern Minnesota, the Iron Range, if if anyone's familiar with that area. We met in Duluth and lived there for a time during school. We lived in Minneapolis for a time and we lived in Wichita, Kansas for a time and we like to travel. We've been around the United States and outside of the United States and just came to appreciate fun little coffee shops, breweries, just the neat atmosphere that those places offer. And it's fun when you go enjoy one of those, you get a sense for what the community is like and maybe some history of that area, or maybe you might run into some locals. It's just kind of a fun atmosphere for us. Definitely. But I think making the leap from appreciating those things to actually doing what the two of you have done. Most people just don't do that. I mean, most people don't. And I think, you know, again, I had shared with you earlier that on the show, we really try to highlight people that are doing interesting, cool things because I'm a firm believer that if we want our communities to thrive, then we have to be willing to try and create the things that we desire in our own community. And that sounds like that's what the two of you did. That became our mantra 
if you would have asked us moving back here in 2012, do you guys want to buy a downtown building that's in complete disrepair and turn it into a community hub? Would you guys <laughs> do that? We'd say, are you crazy? I right. don't want to do that. But moving back here, we love Sleepy Eye. We love small town life. We were excited to raise our children here. At the time when we moved back, we had one child and two came after we moved back. We miss those things. And that's, we miss those little coffee shops and breweries and mm -hmm. other opportunities to get out and have fun. And we would drive downtown, you know, drive through Main Street and see all these wonderful old buildings and say, who owns that building? What are they going to do with it? Why is nothing going on in our downtown? We see other towns that have fun things going on. And why can't that come to CPI? And, you know, we, we hear other people say the same thing. And that went on for a, a good few years um, until probably sometime in 2017, when my husband, who has been a home brewer since, what, 2006 or so? Yeah, right around somewhere around there. So he's been a home brewer that long and just kind of dabbled with some winemaking, but a lot of beer making. And so he and his buddies, some of whom were also beer makers, home brewers, and also beer appreciators, um, <laughs> came together and said, you know what? There's a lot of microbreweries popping up. I think we could probably put a microbrewery in Sleepy Eye. So when I first heard this, I okay, this is all a pipe dream. It's not going to happen. It just doesn't seem like something that would really come to fruition. But then these guys started talking about it more and more, and I heard more and more about it. And over the next few months, we were thinking, you know, maybe we should look downtown at some of these buildings and see if this could even happen. And of course, being the coffee lover that I am, loving all these cute little coffee shops, I said, well, if we're going to buy a building that's going to be a brewery open in the evenings, then what is it going to do during the day? We should put a coffee shop in the building as well. And then we could justify this whole big renovation. And so the idea continued to evolve and we toured a few buildings, always with our eye on the Pix Theater, which had been our favorite with this iconic marquee that you saw when you drove. Yeah, town. right. Oh, it's so cool. <laughs> it went through changes through the years. We have some photos of the marquee and it, it did go through some changes, but the way that you see it now, it's really just been cleaned up. Um, so we ended up cleaning up some of the steel, replacing the roof on the marquee, replacing the neon and repainting the big PIX letters. We have new changeable letters for the marquee. They actually go up manually. Each individual letter gets placed on the marquee by a little tool that elevates it up to the rack that it hangs on on the marquee so it's an old-fashioned marquee but that was kind of like the showpiece that attracted us to that building don't see that anymore right i was gonna say i know i've driven past it since i was a kid and always wish the owner would fix it up and just light up the marquee even if nothing was inside of the building and right i said i'd said that numerous times kind of to myself or maybe whoever i was driving with if i own that the first thing I would do was fix up that marquee. And I don't know if it was fortunate or unfortunate, but I guess I got that opportunity. Right. Well, and I, you know, I appreciate hearing, I definitely have questions about the brewery side of it because that's not something, and not that a coffee shop is easy to start up either, but I think overall there's maybe a little less expertise that needs to be involved. I was so curious how you came to run a brewery too. So Maybe, Adam, if you want to share a little bit of, about that, like how many of you were there? What was that whole process like for you? Yeah. Well, yeah, that's you know, the interesting process, somewhat of a long story, but I think we can say it, we can get through it fairly quick. Uh, Carlin had mentioned I homebrewed since 2006, and I was kind of intermittent, and I started with wine. Actually, one of my high school teachers that I had stayed in touch with, her spouse taught me winemaking while I was in medical school. And... From there, when you make wine, you make five gallons of wine, but that's 30 bottles. There's not a lot you can do with 30 bottles of relatively bad wine. <laughs> so it, it, I quickly switched to beer, and five gallons makes about two cases of beer. And that's a usable amount, especially for males in their low 20s. We didn't have any problem going through that. Sure. And so we kind of continued with beer brewing. Uh, you know, much more sporadic than we would like, but but we did it, and uh, and with a number of different friends, kind of over the years, 
but the group of five of us that ended up starting the brewery together all live in Sleepy Eye currently. And uh, basically, we kind of have our, our men's day Wednesday together all the time, whether it's golf or basketball or beer brewing. Uh, that's kind of what we did. And the brewery started with an idea of getting kind of a fancy $5,000 five-gallon brewing system. And we're like, well, we could set this up in a garage and it'd be fun and easy. And this would, you know, this is what we can do on Wednesday nights when we hang out and we'll get beer out of the deal. So it'll be great. So we start looking at that and we're like, well, what if we opened a little tiny brewery or something and maybe opened one day a week or something we're like, well, okay. So we kind of upgraded our size to a system that make about two kegs at a time. And then we mm-hmm. started these breweries around the area and they kind of started laughing at us and said, well, you'll trade that system in after a month. Basically saying you'll, with the amount of demand there is for a microbrewery, you, you will never keep up, only making two kegs at a time. And so we started, the more we talked to people, the more that was kind of confirmed and looked at numbers. And you're like, oh my gosh, this is way bigger than we anticipated. And we ended up upgrading sizes over and over and over again to the, the size that we currently have, which you saw when you were there. Mm-hmm. Um, we make about three barrels at a time, which is approximately six kegs per batch, which is still a very small batch, but it's much more manageable when you get, for the labor involved, it's about a keg an hour. Wow. Wow. I find this so fascinating. I mean, really, I can't even tell you guys like how excited I am to be hearing this whole story because I, again, there are themes with the people that I talk to on this show. And a lot of times I feel like we talked about the one where most of the time people doing really cool things in their community it's because they felt a, a need for themselves, right? Like they wanted to, it's not selfish, but it's also saying, well, I want this thing. So instead of waiting around for someone to do it for me, we're going to do it. The second thing is I feel like a lot of times people are pivoting a passion or something of their own. Maybe it's a creative outlet. Maybe it's an interest and they're pivoting that into something that the rest of the community can enjoy. And it's, home brewing is so cool. And I think it's so cool that there's five of you that all came back. Did you all, you all left and then came back to Sleepy Eye? Is is that right? Yeah. Four of us grew up in Sleepy Eye and uh, the fifth partner actually grew up about a half hour away. But strangely, after college, he had lived in Sleepy Eye for a number of years, moved away and has since moved back. Ah, It's so cool. Yeah. This community is so fortunate to have you two in it. It's just phenomenally cool. Okay. So it sounds like the brewery thing took off pretty quickly. How um, did you have competition on the coffee shop side of things, Carlin? No, I shouldn't say no. I mean, we do have a Hardee's and they serve coffee. Oh, so that's have- not competition for you. Come yeah. on now. <laughs> <laughs> we have a gas station and they serve coffee, but yeah. no, we don't. We really don't have any other coffee in town. Or a number of the gas stations in town do have booths, and a, a lot of people do even now hang out there and drink and drink coffee. Sure. Um, but as far as a dedicated coffee shop, there certainly w- was not a, a coffee shop in town. And it's something that, that we miss a lot moving mm-hmm. back from larger cities. And I think the same could be said of, uh, of the brewery. Oh, definitely. So, so when we were thinking about getting this coffee shop going, of course, and, you know, in the brewery too, we knew we weren't going to be quitting our day jobs. We knew that was not going to happen. But we also, you know, it, it came to be clear that Adam and I were going to be the investors for the building and the renovation and we were going to we were going to own the building and we were going to own the coffee shop business on that side and then Adam was going to be one of the five partners on the brewery side so it became pretty clear that we were going to need managers for this whole operation and we were going to have to have people running the day-to-day operations of the place so all of that is happening at the same time that we're looking at downtown buildings and trying to figure out if any of these buildings are going to work for us or if we really want to take this leap and what we're going to do about this vision that we had. Yeah. I'm really glad you're heading into this because that was going to be my question. Like how on earth are you two basically running these things, even though Adam being a fifth partner, right? You're still, you have, there's not only a financial investment, but there's a spirit and a soul and a heart investment in these businesses and the fact that you didn't quit your day jobs is astounding to me. I would love to hear a little bit about like how you actually found dedicated managers to do this work. Not saying that you, that you can't, but workforce is such a challenge in small communities. It's really difficult. I would love to hear what that part of this has been like for you guys, because I think owner-operated small businesses tend to be a little easier go. You maybe have 
zero life balance with that. But mm-hmm. I haven't seen a lot of cases where this it successfully can be, you know, managed by somebody other than the owners. So I would love to hear what this really looked like for you too. From the start, uh, one of the brewery owners will just call me electrician because he he is the electrician <laughs> for the whole building, and he was kind of the one who started with this idea of getting better brewing equipment and brewing more frequently. And then his mind goes 100 miles an hour, and so does he. I don't know how he does it. He kind of kept pushing this more and more and more, and he certainly wasn't pushing us along, but he was coming up with more ideas and and doing a ton of research. I mean, without him, I, we certainly could not have done it. But he helped a ton, not just behind the scenes, uh, on the scene with, with the building and everything. And it's one of his best friends who actually moved back from Virginia with his wife that came back to run the coffee shop. They came back early in the process when when we were looking at, at the building and talking about just basically the concept of what we were looking at. And they saw the building in shambles. And somehow Carlin was able to share her vision of it with them and convince them that this would be a could possibly be a good idea for them to move their, their family with four kids back here to run it. Wow. And it's Dave and Samara are their names who run the coffee shop and Samara does the baking and, and Dave runs kind of the coffee shop and handles the management aspects of it. And they move back with all four kids and Dave grew up here and, and I think he was kind of looking for a reason to move back. He'd gotten to experience a number of other places in the U.S. and was ready to move back with his kids to kind of give them the same opportunity growing up that he had. And so the timing kind of was right and things fell into place. Uh, and somehow all of these moving pieces fell together and it ended up working out really well. So the ironic thing about Dave and Samara, who are wonderful, but their background is not in running a coffee shop or a cafe or a bakery or anything of that sort, surprisingly. Dave's background is in journalism, and he has worked for a, a number of different publications, newspapers, and most recently was kind of doing public relations for the Department of Transportation in Virginia. So he has a lot of advertising, journalism, I guess, public relations type background. And then his wife, Samara, her background is in kind of art education, arts education, and performance arts. So her passion, her personal passion is baking and cooking. And the two of them kind of, this is, I guess, their has been their secret wish or their kind of, you know, their heart's desire to run a coffee shop or run a, some kind of cafe where Samara can use her, her baking talents and her cooking talents. And Dave can kind of run the overall scene. And, you know, like Adam said, when they came back and they, they saw what the raw building looked like and what our visions were, they aligned with us. And I'm just a little bit surprised, but really, really happy that they did. Oh my goodness. This story just to me, just gets better and better. The more the two of you talk, I think there's so many things to be said. I do talk a lot about returning back to our hometown and that I hope that through this show, all of us collectively can do a better job maybe of encouraging our students to return one day, you know, and I think the, what you guys are doing is you're showing people all the things that are possible. That's what everybody we feature on the show. That's what happens as you say, and you had a bunch of things fall into place. Like you already said, which what a gift. I mean, my goodness to have these, this couple, especially they're a couple. And again, their backgrounds being so different from what they're currently doing, but none of their backgrounds, their backgrounds are probably still infused in the way that they run your business. I would guess. Is that accurate to say? I mean, the idea that he has journalism and PR, he thinks about the world differently. But I think that's part of it is recognizing like you might go off to school and you two went to be doc- your doctors for crying out loud. That's a pretty clear career path, right? You can pick where you're going to do it or you know exactly what you're going to specialize in. But here on the side, you're still doing something that's so unique, so different. And I think it's partly helping everybody realize that we live in a world now where you maybe don't have to do exactly the thing that you at one time set out to do and all your backgrounds can still be useful in pivoting it into something different in the future. It's just such a cool story. I would definitely agree with that. I mean, before we get to, I mean, we're not the only ones in this community or any small community that wear multiple hats. I mean, yeah, right. Although 
I'm really proud of what we've done and you mm-hmm. know, hopefully our future is bright and things will continue to evolve in such a great way. There are a lot of people in this community. I mean, there are people who work day jobs, you know, in business, and then they are also farming on the side and they're yeah, also part right. of the fire department and, you know, others who are EMTs and also do other jobs. And then they sit on boards and they volunteer. And I mean, the list goes on and on. And there's many, many people that I can name by name in our community who do those types of things. And you have to, in order to help a small community survive and go on and thrive. So this happened to be the role that we stepped into as our, I guess, our side jobs. (laughs) And I guess that's where we're at. Yeah. And I think what you just said is so important. It still, it just speaks to impact you know, like this millennial generation. So a lot of these, and again, there's a whole generation now, I don't even know what they're called, the ones that are younger than them. Um, But when we think about how do we get that group of people to consider coming back to our rural communities? I think what you just touched on as part of it is helping them understand like they're socially conscious as a generation. And so to say, you can come back and you can impact and influence and contribute in such a variety of ways in a small town. It's beautiful, right? And like you said, we do need people that have that mindset because that's how small towns function. But if people really care about contribution, small towns are a great place to look to do that. Yeah, I think there's unbelievable opportunity for something like that. If as physicians, we try to buy an old building in downtown Minneapolis, somewhere like that with real estate costs and rent costs. I mean, it's just, it's out of the question. Mm -hmm. Uh, Here for us, this ended up being a natural fit for us, uh, partly because Carlin loves, she loves the design aspect and and coffee. So those things, she was able to do her building design and, you know, it was a hobby and a passion. Mm -hmm. So it created that opportunity for her. And then we were able to fill the space with the coffee shop, uh, essentially, and fulfill another need. For me, I mean, brewing beer is biochemistry, and that's what most of medicine is. So that's somewhat a natural fit as well, where it's a similar skill set, just applied in a totally different way. Uh, Right, right. You know, on the construction side, that used to be my summer job as I was going through med school. So taking Carlin's vision and her ideas and trying to make them practical and apply them to a way that that we can build something or, or create what she's visioning, that was kind of... That became my task, I think, Uh, between myself and our carpenters who did all the work. Carlin may have made all of our heads crazy uh, a few times, but we all love the product. Oh, it was so fun. I bring them drawings all the time that I'd have, and I think of things. I'd lay in bed at night and think of things and write them down or do these drawings on graph paper and bring them. And they look at me like, okay. And then I'd be like, just stay with me here. It's going to be great. And then as things started coming together, then everybody kind of was starting to see what I saw. And it's like, oh, okay. I know where we're going here now. I know why you want us to do it that way. Well, the space is so impressive. I mean, it really is so impressive. I loved everything about it. And that's what prompted me, of course, to reach out. I actually think you have a population sign on your community, on the little green sign, right? When you're coming into the city limits, Mm -hmm. I'm pretty sure I saw that it was about 3,500 people. And again, I I get that, you know, that geographical positioning in terms of, you know, proximity to a larger community, those things definitely have a play a role, but it is so well done. I, like I said, I didn't get to taste anything on the beer side of things. I'll have to make a trip back out sometime soon. But I just think, again, I feel like you're somewhat downplaying the significance of what you did. It's so, it really is so impressive. And I know you're not the only ones to ever have done anything like this. But it's a testament to your belief in what's possible for Sleepy Eye. That's for sure. It's pretty cool. What has been some of the feedback from people? How about early on when you were buying the building? Were people all very supportive? Did you get a lot of people questioning if you had completely lost all your senses? Or was it a mix of that? Like, what was the overall response from the community when you first were looking at it? Yeah, I think all of the above. But (laughs) there. There was a lot of, I mean, a ton of excitement because I, a huge number of people in town really wanted to have a coffee shop and really wanted to have a brewery. And we really wanted to get a restaurant. You know, there's a ton of, I don't know, excitement or, or wishful thinking about all of that. And some were like, you guys are nuts. When You don't have enough time to do this. 
And then there's also a really pessimistic crowd because there's been a lot of ideas that, that come and go and they start and then they stop and, and they don't end up happening. There was a lot of the, well, we'll believe it when we see it kind of attitude. And, and that was sort of one of my big things doing this. I'm like, if we start this, we are finishing. We're not stopping halfway. And there were many times halfway when I really desperately wanted to stop. <laughs> but, but I did. I was having fun. <laughs> yeah, yeah, she was enjoying it, and I was having small st- stress-induced heart attacks. Yeah. I think we held but, each other through the process. I mean, when he was ready to throw in the towel, I'm like, no, wait, wait it's time for the wood floor to go in. It's going to be great. It's going to be beautiful. And, you know, it's we're just around the corner to, to getting to meeting our next major milestone, getting, you know, something big. I think as we got closer to completion and as people saw work going on more and more, um, just the excitement continued to build. And like I said, it was very, very, very positive. And I would say the majority of people were very positive, very encouraging to us. And, you know, and they were encouraged by the fact that they always saw things going on there. And going back to what Adam said earlier about the marquee, we did decide to get the marquee done first. So that's where we focused our energy first is getting that fixed up and lit up. And it's so neat that so many things have happened that have been luck or fate or intervention or whatever it is. But we actually completed our electrician friend, Judd and Adam were up on Christmas Eve morning, installing the last of the light bulbs that are located on the underside of the marquee. And once that was done and they turn it on, the whole marquee could light up and we could put a message on the outside like lettering so of course we're going to take the opportunity to say merry christmas and happy new year on christmas eve one on the one side one on the other and so we turned it on or i think we had it set on a timer so that you know when most people in town were attending their christmas eve church service they could leave leave after church was over at you know whatever time we had it set for and it was turned on so that was kind of our announcement to the community like this is going on. We're doing it. It's real. Believe all the rumors. Things are right. happening. That was Christmas Eve 2018. The marquee turned on. We had purchased the building in November of 2017. So that was just over a year after we purchased the building is when the marquee was completed and we lit it up. That's super cool. And I can only imagine that there were a ton of rumors. That's a long, I mean, a year is not a long time for the amount of work. It sounds that you had to put into the building, but it's a long time for people to wait, you know, to see something so concrete, like this is what it is. And lighting the marquee is a really cool way to say, yep, here we are. (laughs) Like you said, you can believe what you've been hearing. Yeah. Judd and I were up there on on ladders that morning it's like christmas eve morning and it's freezing cold windy and all these people are driving by and him and i are out there hanging up all these channels for all the lights to sit in and putting it's like 210 lights or something underneath the marquee that were screwing in all these lights while we were doing it that morning i know people are driving by like those guys are nuts right and we briefly turned it on and just plugged it in for like 10 seconds to make sure it sort of worked and then we plugged it into one of those cheap Christmas light timers that you use in your house with all the little, <laughs> you got to push. Yep. We had no idea if we did it right. And we had it turned on and it was supposed to come on at, I think, I think church was at like 4.30. So it was going to come on at 5, 5.15, something like that. And him and I were in church just sweating. Like, man, I hope that thing worked. No kidding. And sitting there having an anxiety attack. And I think. I told Carlin while we were talking to people on the way out of church, I'm like, I just got to get out of here. I got to go see if it works. <laughs> yeah. it, it was the coolest thing, just stopping. We could park in an alley uh, across from the building and see people's reactions. A, a number of cars that, that stopped and looked at it. It was, it was unbelievable. People jumping out and taking pictures. And yeah. Oh, that's so up, neat. We debuted our, our Facebook page that night and we got a lot of good feedback from people that way. So it was really, it was, I think it was a boost for us too. Like, you know, the marquee's on, people are excited and people really want this. And that kind of gave us a, a really nice boost to get us going with renovating the inside and proceeding with our plans. What was your opening date? When did you actually open for business? So the coffee shop opened on October 1st was the official opening date. So October 1st, 2019. So just about 
five months ago or so. Okay. And then um, the brewery opened for business on December 27th was their first day. So, so yeah, you haven't been, haven't been at it all that long in terms of being open to the public. And I know it's very hard to distill down like the biggest things that you've learned, but is there anything that what you've experienced so far that you just straight up would have done differently? I actually don't think there is a ton. Yeah, I don't know if there there really is a ton that we would have. I mean, the timeline could certainly be faster now that we're better educated about the process. Yeah, sure, um, right. Just the process from permitting to having an architect sign off on your plans and do a code review and meeting all the different codes that are out there, learning about uh, how many different things that, that there are in codes. So those, obst- those obstacles were huge along the way. And I guess getting a better understanding of, uh, of those has helped significantly. I think that would really be the biggest thing is, is knowing what the code issue or the, the legal issues as far as permitting were ahead of time to be able to streamline that and work with an architect sooner rather than later and you know understanding there are different ways of working with architects that can make it affordable where that was our biggest concern is if an architect fully runs the project it's going to be you know the cost will be massive and that wasn't the case we were able to do it economically we did work with our local home builder their engineer designer we came at them with some floor plan ideas that we had and we put them down on paper. And then by the time we got to the architect, he just had to tweak a few things to meet code. And we didn't really have to make such big changes, but our our local home builder was really helpful with us that way. And the other thing I guess I would say to give a plug to all of our contractors, people around town hear me say this all the time, but we would not have been able to do this without our local contractors. They were outstanding. And if, if we had been, you know, maybe in a bigger city where you don't have word of mouth reputation for people as much because it's just so big. Their schedules are different. You know, they're less available or maybe less flexible. That was all not true. And Sleepy Eye, we had, you know, just wonderful contractors from our, our carpenters were amazing. They did a lot of the flooring. We had a gentleman who specializes in laying wood flooring, refinishing wood flooring. He's just very, very talented who did our wood floors. We had brick Mason, who repointed a lot of the exterior brick and then also cleaned up a lot of the interior brick for us. We had a wonderful iron worker who made all custom made all the railings. So when you were inside, all of those yeah. are by this gentleman, v- local, right down the road. He's like, wow, just amazing, like super talented guy. Our plumbers were outstanding. Electrician, of course, is one of the owners on the breeze. So he put his heart and soul into everything. And that place is, I mean, it's got classic looks, but it's got very modern function when it comes to like the music system, the speakers, the alarm and monitoring system, the lighting is just yeah. like amazing. Yeah. It's, it's stuff you would never think that you could get in a small town. We probably used 20 to 30 different contractors along the way, but the furthest one away is like 25 miles. And that was our iron worker. Otherwise, it's basically between the vast majority was Sleepy Eye, a occasional. Springfield. Uh, yes, yeah, Springfield, New Ulm, they're all 15 minutes away. These were all the work that we had done in the building basically came from, I mean, from drywall to windows and doors. Oh, I and, forgot our windows and doors, guys. They're right down the road in New Ulm, and they did some custom etched glass on the front doors and LED lights. Like, just crazy. Awesome. A lot of the time, they just saw it as an opportunity to show what they can do. Um, right. They, they kind of start to see where we're going with the project and they would be excited about it as well. And then they would say, well, I don't want to just put in some boring hog gates. I'm, I'm going to make your railings. Uh, the guy would come back with the design and the same thing happened with the windows and the doors. It's like, I don't want your doors to look like everybody else. We have this etching machine that we're trying to start using. Let us etch the glass and see what it looks like. So a ton of contractors just use it as an opportunity, I think. And I mean, they had an interest in it and felt invested in the project and and they really added to the overall product. And that right there too, I think it's a cool, cool frame around this that, and by doing that, like you said, you used, you said, I think 30 potentially different people and giving everybody a chance to innovate, right? Giving everybody a chance to have their little mark on that building 
really changes the ownership from something that the two of you and your business partners own to it's really something that was collaboratively built. And I just think that, that there's a spirit in that that has momentum that couldn't really be created any other way. Yeah. I absolutely agree. Yeah. yeah. We're really blessed to have wonderful craftsmen, I would say, in our small town. Uh, well, you two are, have been, I've just thoroughly enjoyed hearing the whole story of, of how this all came to be. It had shared with you that there's really only one question that I ever consider canned, <laughs> where I have this preset list of questions. Um, our whole theme on the Small Town Big Talk show is about living big in your small town. So what does that mean to the two of you? I will, I'll direct quote some of our customers who come in to the building. They say, wow, I feel like I'm not even in sleepy eye. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you could take it one way or to us, that means that people feel special. I've had other people say, this is my favorite place, or this is a special place to me. I love it here. That's what we want to give to people is that they get to experience something special when they're there whether it's looking around and enjoying your surroundings or you're having a cup of coffee that's really good and locally sourced or a delicious sandwich with bread made fresh in house or a beer that's brewed right over there by guys who live here in sleepy. I, I mean, all of those things add to, I guess, living big or getting that feeling that you're in a kind of a special, unique place. Yeah, that's awesome. Adam, what about you? It's bringing opportunities to do things from an entertainment standpoint that you can do in a bigger city in your small town environment where you have all the perks and benefits of being in a small town, which I still think there's nowhere better to live and grow up and raise kids in a small town. It's always the entertainment type stuff that we lack mm -hmm. and bringing a type of entertainment that, that you typically only find in a bigger town to a right. small town is really kind of what it would, would mean to me, I guess. Yeah. Well, and I think that's a huge part of it. As I had mentioned, that's something that in a lot of the studies of out migration or, you know, is there a resurgence, that whole question of, is there a resurgence of people moving back to rural communities? That's what they, people miss the most. That's the thing that's always glaringly absent, right? Are those kind of cultural or just like you said, entertainment opportunities. So to have been able to offer that and combine it with something where people can get good food, coffee, and beer too just a, a really great thing for your community. I can't wait to come back through and um, hopefully, like I said, closer to the evening so I can try your beer. <laughs> we will, um, in, in the show notes, we will link to all of your social, anything that you, the two of you want to share so people can follow along with your story. But I just want to thank you again for your time, taking time out of your busy days to share this story with us and to inspire everybody that's going to listen to this. Sure. Thank you, Rebecca. Thank you. Thanks for listening to this week's episode of the Small Town Big Talk Show. If you enjoyed today's show, we invite you to subscribe on Stitcher, Spotify, or Apple Podcasts, and we'd love for you to leave us a five-star review. The more reviews we get, the easier it will be for other small town friends to find us. We encourage you to keep on living big in your small town because the size of your life is not determined by your zip code.